Hey, how's it going? Today I want to talk to you about the top three changes in Warhammer K 9th edition. Of course, these are changes from 8th edition to 9th edition, not from 7th edition or 6th edition or anything else. This is very specifically just really the incremental changes that they created here into 9th edition that I think have helped the game the most. Overall, there's a lot of things about this edition that you know we can talk about, but this video is going to focus primarily on the top three changes that have happened. There will be a follow-up video for the worst three changes, of course, as all YouTubers are wont to do, and three changes or four changes that just didn't quite go far enough. So let's just dive right into it. The number one change that I think has affected Warhammer 40k in ninth edition is the change to Smite. I run usually some pretty psychic heavy armies. I'm a Thousand Suns player by default. I like my Death Guard as well. They have a few Smites. And generally speaking, I, I, I do believe that psychic armies are, are a lot of fun to play just because they get that extra phase and it adds a wrinkle to the strategy of every round. The reason I like the Smite change being a Thousand Suns player is because the Thousand Suns have access to three or four different disciplines. And it just feels kind of weird to me that every single game that you play, you take two basic spells, warp time, and then maybe the death hex, and then everything else is just smite. You don't have to worry about anything else because you're just going to want to deal mortal wounds with anything that's not actually casting buffs to your units. And since you, only, you can only cast two of those buff spells at any given time, you're just constantly just spamming smite. So I like this change specifically because it forces you to choose some of those other spells that have a higher warp charge value and don't necessarily have the most direct mortal wound effect that you see from the smites. So if you take, for example, uh, Flickering Flames of Zinch, that is a seven warp cost spell where you roll nine dice and then whatever hits a six counts as a mortal wound. So technically you have a much higher and potential for mortal wounds than you would have a regular smite, but on average, you're gonna get one or two. So at the end of the day, it's just nice to see these armies that are supposed to be filled with psychics that know all these different spells, they're supposed to be wizarding all over the battlefield, actually wizarding all over the battlefield, rather than just casting the same old spell over and over again. You know, you have that lightning bolt meet, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. That's not what I want my, my Thousand Sun sorcerers that have been practicing this crap for 10,000 years to be doing over and over again. Beyond that, while I know that this is more of just a semantic issue, I feel like the word smite has more of a holy connotation to it. So I don't really like it when, say, a Xenos faction like the Eldar or the Tyranids or even the Chaos Sorcerers, who are supposed to be obviously evil, are constantly casting smite. You know, when you play World of Warcraft, the priest gets smite. When you think of smite in the D&D &D lore, it's more of a holy you know, good guy spell. So just from a lore perspective, it's a little wonky to me and a little bit weird that we're seeing evil people constantly just casting smite. It just doesn't make sense to me. Um, so I'm, I'm glad that that, cha that change is making it so that we're moving more towards lore friendly spells that aren't just a, a generic spell that's across every single army. Because again, one of my favorite things about 40k is the lore, is the character of each army, is how everything, you know, kind of fits together in the greater narrative. Uh, and I think 8th edition lost some of that when it kind of unified all the rules and everything like that. But, you know, changes like this help us get back to that more lore-friendly uh, situation. The other thing that I like about it is that it does make you have to choose these different spells very specifically and how you're going to cast them very differently. So say you have Magnus and Aramon on the same board next to a bunch of little sorcerers. You know that Magnus and Aramon have a more powerful smite. So the idea is, do you cast them first specifically for the idea that you want to make sure you get that more powerful smite off? Or do you cast them last because they have the bonus to their psychic spells? You know, those kinds of weights are, are the things that make this game more strategic and make it more fun at the end of the day. You know, what's even the point of having a warp cast value for a five warp charge spell when you have plus two or plus one to your warp or to your psychic tests? At that point, you have to roll double once and that's the only way to fail it. And at that point, you're also getting the perils of the warp. So it, 
it changes, you know, the risk reward factor of the psychic phase a little bit more. It makes you rethink really what you're doing, you know. Do you want to replace one of your one of your sorcerers that's probably not going to get the smite off, say, your fifth sergeant on a Rubik Marine squad or a Terminator squad or whatever it is. You want to replace that spell, that smite, because you're probably not going to cast it by the time it gets to that character, with something like the Flickering Flames of Zinch or the Death Hex. And those are the more important psychic spells. At the end of the day, this kind of goes back into the idea that this game is just a much deadlier version of what this game used to be, and mortal wounds are kind of part of the reason why that is. But if you're not going to get those mortal wounds, you still want to make sure that you're using that unit to its fullest potential, especially before it gets wiped off the board on second turn. So I like this change to Smite. I think it's generally going to affect the psychic phase a lot more than you know any any other changes that have been seen uh, so far in this edition. And generally, anything that moves the psychic armies away from casting smite it's a good idea smite is just the most boring lackluster not lore friendly power that's in this game and you know even if they were just replace each faction's number one psychic spell with a smite kind of version i think that would be good say the space marines get a smite that also adds to leadership for units uh, does less damage but adds a little bit of leadership you know chaos uh, Marines could have a smite that does more damage but costs more, or the Zinch ones have a, a regular smite that adds, you know, some sort of radius thing. I, I do think that generally speaking, the psychic phase could use a little bit of work, but this is in the right direction. You know, forcing the armies to have more options or have to utilize those other options, I think that's the right call. And generally speaking, um, in the last few games that I've played with my Thousand Sons, that's what I've been doing. I, I Just because I get to my third or fourth smite, trying to cast it on a nine, I'd rather cast Doom Bolt on a nine than smite on a nine, right? The 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 cost the cost benefit ratios there are, you know, obviously the Doom Bolt is better if it gets off correctly. So I, I do like this change. I know a lot of people are saying, but they're the Psychic Army. They should be able... No, I think this is more of a lore thing, and the Psychic Army does have plenty of options to replace that that portion, that missing gap. And it, it's, a, it's a more lore-friendly version of replacing it. So, yes, continue with this change to Smite. Please don't retcon it later or put it into a chapter approved or whatever it's called when they change the rules and they add the beta rules. I, I like this as it is. And it should, it should kind of be a warning or kind of a, a lead into different changes in different phases later on that differentiate the armies a little bit more. So this is a general rule change that makes it so that each individual army feels a little bit different. So after that, we have probably what I think is my favorite change in 9th edition so far. And it's the updated design of not only the Space Marines, but the Necrons, and what I feel like is going to be moving forward, just a, a more fantasy slash medieval look of most of the units. Um, so I'm not really a fan of how much Primera stuff has been coming out, but I am a fan of generally the bigger Marines like that. And even bigger than that, I'm really enjoying this new fantasy aesthetic they've added. Like they have the new bracers on the Assault Marines. I think that's a really good look for them. I, I did not like the 8th edition and representation of what the Primaris Marines were with all of their technological advanced wristbands that had all the lights and the beboops and all that you know, it, that's not what the Space Marines are supposed to be. And I get that call it has just reinvented everything that's ever been invented throughout the entire Imperium's history. Again, also not a fan of that lore. But I do really like this whole Space Marines going back to the, you know, having the bones uh, representing their old, like, saints and, and old fallen heroes. I like the, the what are they called, the the sensors or whatever, those little jars with the incense in them. I, I like that motif. It makes, it, it's a really a throwback to what the Space Marines have been in the past. Um, maybe not when they first came out, but, you know, kind of that Dawn of War idea of what the Space Marines were. That's my favorite Space Marine motif. And I don't need them to be the, the high-tech faction. You know, this whole idea of having Space Marines flying around with these big jump packs. Um, not even the jump packs, the actual jet packs. You know, the... 
the Inceptors. I don't really like those guys. I don't like this this all this grav stuff that they're putting on all the Space Marine vehicles. None of that really makes sense to me because we already have factions that do that. The Tower, the advanced guys. You know, they're advanced with technology. The Eldar are advanced with their ability to use Wraithbone and and Seer Stones and all that. So why make this faction technologically advanced? It doesn't make sense. They should be tough, yeah, and have you know that kind of high medieval style of warfare where they just have big armored guys with you know big weapons but their weapons aren't supposed to be advanced they, they should be kind of that that way they were before you know a plasma cannon would shoot it would do a good amount of damage but it could kill you you know now we have so many rerolls and everything that the plasma guns don't even seem like they're gonna have a risk of blowing up in your hands they just fixed the technology basically and now we're, re we're seeing the release of the new Hellblaster data sheets that are coming with packaged with the actual infantry models, the new models that they're releasing. And it seems like those guys are also losing their, their chance to explode just off the bat. But, you know, until the actual codex releases, uh, I'll hold judgment on that. But, you know, generally speaking, I do like how the Imperium is kind of moving back towards that mid-tier te technological level. You know, I, and again, part of the problem with this isn't just the redesign of the Space Marines. It's kind of the, the fact that now we have these Space Marines with really high technology, but we still have this Imperial Guard line from 15 years ago that uses the same technology as the Small Marines. Or in that same case, you're seeing that the Small Marines are going to two wounds and the Primaris Marines are staying at two wounds. Yet, you know, why aren't the Small Marines using the Big Marines technology? Like, they have better weapons. The bolt rifles are much better than the bolt guns. You know, the Hellblaster plasma guns are much better than the plasma cannons. It just, it seems weird to me to have all these high-tech things and then only have it dedicated to just one small portion of the Imperium. But that's why I like it when they're going back to this whole sword and board style, just assault marine. You know, that looks cool on the Marines. I, I, I think the more medieval kind of aesthetic that they maintain that high gothic that they've got i think that's great um, i really did not like most of the marine releases in eighth edition i like kind of their play style I, I did not like the auras i i thought they were unfair and everything like that but from a design perspective if you take all of the marines that release in eighth edition pretty much just give them the van braces or the bracers whatever you want to call them i think we've got ourselves a pretty good idea of what the marines should look like so that's my second favorite thing I think I'll go along with that. I don't really like the Mechanicus designs that have come out. I can see where they're going with it, and I can see why some people will like it. And frankly, it's better that they do differentiate themselves a little bit. But I do wish instead of horses that were just total machines, maybe they had some sort of bioorganic, you know, human centipede style servitor or something like that. You know, there's supposed to be more of that body horror, just latching things onto you mechanically side. So the idea that there's just a mechanical horse that doesn't have any part of the servitor built into it or anything like that, or that they're using paper wings, that it doesn't really make sense to me. Um, like I like the I like the legs on those guys. I like the idea of those guys, but then they have paper wings, or they have an ornithopter with paper wings. You know, I, I just don't believe that if you were growing up on Mars, where the you know supposedly the storms are just these giant wind storms that are you know that make the Dust Bowl look like a little you know sandbox. Why would you have paper wings? I mean, what kind of paper is this? You know, that doesn't really make sense. And I appreciate the aesthetic, and I guess they're going for that Da Vinci style, which again also doesn't make sense. But that's that to me wasn't really what the mechanic represented. They represented the body horror, like when you have those striders. When you look at them closely, there's a servitor attached on the underbelly of it that has all of its limbs cut off, and it's just this thing built into the machine that's controlling it, right? That to me, those, the dragoons is what they were called. That to me is what the Mechanicus is. They don't really care about flesh as long as they meet the ends of making themselves more of a machine, right? So going back to an organic representation of what these machines are, it is counterintuitive to the Mechanicus design, right? If the machine is the ultimate goal, why do they have this? But again, I do appreciate that they are updating designs, that they are releasing these new models, that they're going for this, this more updated aesthetic, just changing it a little bit to make sure that we're not getting the same things over and over again. So, you know, I'm, I'm not a Mechanicus player, so obviously I don't need to buy an Ornithopter or one of those horse dog things. 
I, you know, I don't like them. But if the mechanics players do like them, they can get them. Um, if they don't like them, I guess you can always kit bash something else in their place. But generally speaking, I don't like that redesign. But I am excited for a redesign at all. I like most of the chaos that they've been releasing. And finally, the Necron redesign. Fantastic. I, I like the idea of these kind of skittering, just giant robot zombie things. And I, I like that they're not going too heavy into the zombie idea. That they're more just, yes, they're old. So they obviously have some wires hanging out. Um, it just it feels like the Necron design is moving in the right direction. Uh, so... I, I, I got two of the Andromeda sets. I built all those guys. I'm not really sure how they play yet because I've never played Necrons before. I, I'm doing really poorly with what I have so far. But, you know, the Big Walker, although some of the designs do seem a little bit derivative of, say, the Protoss designs in StarCraft II. Say, the Tall Walker is like a Colossus. You've got the, the, the Destroyers with the Big Blades. They seem a little bit like Dragoons or Immortals. Mm, but they are different enough, I think. And... You know, while you can call it deriz derivative of those other Protoss things, they're not the same really in any capacity. They just kind of have similar aesthetics. But, you know, it's it's going to happen. We're talking about sci-fi here. If, if every single sci-fi that had a little bit of a derivative design or a derivative idea was castigated for it, there would be no sci-fi left over. Just like, you know, if we castigated every sort of fantasy um, story that has an elf in it because... Lord of the Rings had elves, we would have no fantasy. So it's okay, you know, and I, I think they, they've done enough to differentiate it and make it kind of its own unique aesthetic. And I, I really like the kind of the metallic beat up look. And hopefully once, you know, they release more of these units and I have a better army of them and I got a better grasp on how they play, the design will make more sense and they'll kind of play into that, that kind of horror of this ancient race metallic, you know, Terminator situation going on. And that leads us into my final point that I think is the best change to make for this edition. I think it's a fantastic change that has really helped balance the game so that there are games that even though there's still a problem with alpha striking with just ranged weapons in this game of just getting shot off the table in the first turn, there's still the opportunity for victory. And that change is the objective-based gaming. So far in the last few games that I've played, as Terran is, as Thousand Suns, against Imperial Guard, against um, Space Marines. Every single time I've played a game, I've I've lost the game, yeah. Uh, Terran is are so garbage. You know, I, I, I'm sure there's a way to play them that's a little bit better than what I'm doing, but generally speaking, they suck. And that sucks that they suck. But I haven't lost any of these games in a total blowout because I was able to play the objectives in these games. So basically, the way these games played out was... My opponent was somewhat turtling behind a Bane Blade and a Philemon Russes, and my army was obviously a melee army. But to try and go up against that kind of a force, it, it would I would just lose too many units on the way in. And due to the new table sizes, I was able to get shot as soon as the game started. So basically, my strategy was to hopefully just control enough of the board around where this turtle was and hold enough objectives and complete enough secondary objectives that no matter how much of my force got blown off the table, I would still have a lot of points. And in most of these games, it almost worked. And this is me playing a Tyranid faction that I haven't played since sixth edition, I don't think, and still maintaining the ability to have a competitive game. Although it may not have felt competitive from the start due to the fact that I wasn't even able to kill one of his tanks. I killed one infantry squad, I think. But by the end, the point score was pretty similar. It was something 80 to 70 or something. And that was because I was able to control so many of the points for the first two or three turns that built up so many points that it was hard for him to be able to break out of his turtle formation and go out into the board and score the rest of the points and hold them until the end of the fifth turn to get all those points. Basically, it, it was a game of attrition at that point. And if you play it just right and you hold your objectives right, you can actually compete against these armies that are supposed to kind of just blow you off the table in the first turn. So I know there's last edition and seventh edition, or sorry, eighth edition, there was this whole problem with the Space Marines with their heavy stalker bolters and their repulsor executioners and all their long range firepower just taking you off the board all at once. But now that we have this ability to hide behind cover in a way that 
holds back line of sight. So you, we can actually hold these objectives without getting shot off the board immediately. And, you know, I guess this goes hand in hand, you know, top three changes point. So change 3.5 is the, the changes to cover. So because the game is so objective based now, the fact that the first floor of every building is now not a line of sight covering piece of terrain makes it much easier to hold these objectives of small infantry squads. And I think that that really has changed the, the, the way the game works and the way you think about playing. Uh, I know that by the end of 8th edition, it always felt like really the end goal was to just murder as much as you can and then whoever murdered the most won the game. And while that still seems like it might be the the name of the game here, considering that I was super murdered and I still lost the game, it still felt like if I had played just a little bit differently or if I had rolled just a little bit better, I could have held one objective just a little bit longer, that would have been the make or break point. So I do like this objective-based gaming. It's, it's cool having the actions because then if you have a melee unit holding the backfield objective that can't shoot anything, you can at least have it do an action and make sure that that action gives you objective points, you know, raise the flag or whatever you want to, or whatever the mission calls for. So there, there's always something that your units can be doing. And I, I think that's something that this game has needed for a while. It's not just, you know, scu scuttling about and hoping that maybe an enemy unit gets close enough for maybe getting a charge, you know. Now having a unit in the backfield doesn't necessarily mean that you're just wasting points. It means that you can actually hold an objective and that objective will, will give you something by the end of the game. So, you know, you, you, you used to have an infantry tax for the stratagems. Now it's almost like there's an infantry tax just to make sure that you can have objectives. But that tax doesn't feel like it's tacked on for the sake of, you know, min-maxing. It, it feels like it's tacked on specifically for playing the game in the way that it should feel like it's good to play. So overall, those are my three changes. The change to smite, I think that's a great thing. The updated unit designs, and I think they're moving in the right direction with that, generally speaking and differentiating the armies a bit more. And finally, the objective-based gaming. And really, I think the objective-based gaming tied in with the terrain changes is the best change they've made to the ninth edition. If they can really refine this a little bit in further releases, I, th I think we're gonna have ourselves a, a pretty competitive game in a way that we haven't seen in a while. Uh, eighth edition really did not feel competitive by the end of it, but at the start of ninth edition, I, I do feel as though there's more of a competitive ability of the game to to move forward so here's to more of these kinds of incremental changes really changing the, the way the game plays and the way the game feels um, in, in a better more strategic fashion and i think at the end of the day that's what these two things do outside of the design i think the objective bases and the changes to smite really do make the game feel more strategic at the end of the day and more and more lore friendly and more battle realistic right you know as much as this fantasy setting can can really provide so that's about it for the top three changes in this game i i, I want to say that you know there's there's a lot to do still I, I i suspect that in chapter approved and all the next releases they're going to start tweaking some of this a little bit but it's a good start i i don't want to say it's the best changes in the world but they're good they are they are good especially these three they they really they really make the game feel better moving into this ninth edition. But as I said at the start of this video, that doesn't mean that all the changes are good or that all the changes went far enough. So stay tuned. On our next video, we'll talk about the four changes that didn't go quite far enough. Have a good day.